This is part two of a lecture 11 of LEC 5300. We'll be talking about the Carhoun and Loewe transformation, which is really just a generalization of the previous result about the Fourier expansion to deal with the case where x of t is not mean square periodic. So if you remember, uh, in the Fourier expansion, we found out that we could <laughs> find an expansion of a random function x of t in terms of a set of known or fixed non-random basis functions, which are complex exponentials, but the weighting functions for the uh, complex exponentials were random variables, complex random variables, but they were uh, orthogonal, which, remember, is related to white uh, because of the fact that uh, if they're zero mean and Gaussian, then it's independent. So to discuss the Carhoun and Lab transformation, I would like to just draw the connection to the Fourier expansion and then <laughs> hopefully through that similarity uh, you'll be able to see how they're connected uh, and the proofs of the properties, for example, uh, the fact that uh, you know x of t is actually equal to this expansion um, and the orthogonality are very similar to the case for the uh, Fourier. So I'll just really go through and point out the similarities. So let's look at the Carhoun and Loeb transformation and compare that with the Fourier series expansion. Uh, and if you uh, compare these two equations here, you can see they're very similar. The only difference is I've replaced uh, this complex exponential here with another function phi sub k. Right? I don't tell you what the phi sub k are, I just say there are some functions here phi sub k, but there's nothing random about these, just like there's nothing random about here. So that all the randomness then in x of t is captured in these uh, coefficients x of k, right? <laughs> which just as in the Fourier case, uh, you can show that they're orthogonal. Right? And you can compute them with a very similar equation here. right? Here I just took uh, the integral times e to the minus j omega, or the complex conjugate of this. And so I do the same thing here. Uh, and there should be a little k uh, down inside here. This thing should say x uh, phi sub k. So formally, then, uh, the Carhoun and Loeb transformation <coughs> simply just says that uh, there exists some phi sub k's, right, such that this is true, right? And uh, the only thing then we have to do is then we'll specify what are the phi sub k's. Unfortunately, we cannot give you a closed form solution for this, but these things depend on the uh, covariance function, right, or because we've assumed everything is zero mean, uh, the covariance function, the correlation function are the same. But you remember in the case of the Fourier transform, we could prove that the correlation function was periodic. Now in this case here, because it's not uh, periodic, in fact, it's not even necessarily stationary, you see that this um, covariance function can depend on t1 and t2. Um, it's not necessarily periodic, and so the reason that we could use uh, complex exponentials here uh, was because that the covariance function had that periodic structure. But now it doesn't, but these coefficients here, or these basis functions, sorry, should depend on the properties of this covariance matrix, or covariance function. Uh, and so that relationship is shown here in this kind of implicit equation where you can see the phi sub k and the phi sub k here appear on both sides of the equation. So this is kind of an implicit definition of the phi sub k's. Right? So the phi sub k's have to satisfy this equation. So each one for each k has to satisfy this equation for some lambda sub k. Right? And so now remember each phi sub k then determines a Fourier, or sorry, a uh, coefficient here, the Carhoun and Loeb coefficient for that basis function. Uh, that's a random variable, a com complex valued random variable, uh, but it has a certain variance, and the variance is given by the lambda sub k. So I have to find not only the phi sub k's, but also uh, these variances lambda sub k. And I'll show you an example of how to do that in a later part. The other thing we have to know about the phi sub k's is that they have to be orthonormal. Right, and a complete orthonormal set. Right, so what do I mean by that? Uh, well, let's look at this term orthonormal first. The orthonormal here uh, really uh, is a combination of two uh, properties. Right, one of them is
orthogonality. Right? And that just means that if I take uh, two of these guys where the k's are different, right, let's say k and m, uh, and I multiply them together, or I multiply k times its, uh, the complex conjugate of m, and then uh, integrate them, then I should get zero. Right? So if k and m are not equal to uh, each other, then I should get zero, which is indicated by this discrete time delta here. Right? And then the other one, uh, normal, then just refers to the fact that it's normalized. Uh, to length one. And so here, if k is equal to m, right, then what I get is this. I get the integral from 0 to t of phi sub k uh, t phi sub k complex conjugate of t dt right, is equal to 1. This thing here is just the squared magnitude, so 0 to t of the squared magnitude phi sub k t dt is equal to 1. And so this is a measure of the length of that function. So properties that of the Carhoun and Loeb transformation, uh, if I know those functions, and so really the hard part of the Carhoun and Loeb transformation is just finding those functions, but the properties are basically the, the same as the uh, Fourier thing, and so we can do the, almost exactly the same kinds of proofs, or the same steps. So if you go back and you look at the steps that we did for the Fourier transform and you look at the corresponding proofs here, the steps are going to be the same. The only difference is I replace this uh, complex exponential by the phi. So, for example, if we want to prove that the coefficients x of k are orthogonal, we have to show that this product here is going to be zero everywhere unless uh, k is equal to m. Right? So we want to prove that this is equal to the delta function uh, times the variance of k. Uh, the kth uh, coefficient, so which is lambda sub k. Um, but we do that just by you know doing the same thing we did before. We have this thing that we're interested in. We replace this by its definition here. We get something here. We have this thing here that we're interested in. We replace uh, this by its definition here. And then we um, use the property of the covariance function here. Say, well, I got this kind of you know equation here that depends on... Uh, phi sub k uh, times the covariance matrix, but I can simplify that using that equation to this. Right? And then if I combine those two things together, and the fact that they're orthonormal, this step here really depends on the fact that they're orthonormal, um, then I get the, this result here. Right? And then the fact that the Carhoun and Loeb expansion equals to x of p and mean square is the same proof as we did in the Fourier uh, section. Right? So you remember the Fourier section, what we did is we took this minus that, and this thing squared should be equal to zero, the expected value of that, and we just expanded it out, right? We do exactly the same thing for the proof of the Kahuna law expansion. We take this, uh, these to this is supposed to be equal to this. We expand out the product, this squared, this times this, this times this, uh, and this thing squared, and so on. We use the properties of the uh, of the coefficients that we figured out in the previous part of the proof uh, to kind of simplify these equations uh, down to something. And you can see, you know, some of these will start canceling out. Uh, and this one here and this one here will cancel out because of a result called Mercer's theorem, which is um, <coughs> kind of the analog of what we saw in the Fourier case. Okay, so that's basically the uh, Carhoun and Loeb transformation. Uh, and so I think the key point there is that uh, there's another expansion. Uh, it really depends on these phi sub k's. And so in the next uh, lecture, we're going to, next sections, then we're going to look at uh, some examples of this. Um, but before we do that, uh, we're going to look at kind of the, the connection between this and the kind of orthogonalization uh, that we've seen before for finite uh, vectors of random variables.